When I was four years old, I boarded an airplane and I arrived here in the United States for the first time. And for an immigrant, in my experience, it feels like you kind of by default have to have a bit of a global perspective because you know that while you might be here, there's another place somewhere else that has influenced and shaped your emotional core and your sense of identity, and that you learn to share it and manage it with the experiences and the cultures that you grow to understand, to learn, and to love here. But I remember very clearly sometime around second grade, I was introduced for the first time to the idea of Earth Day, the national holiday that we first celebrated in 1970, and that marked the beginning of the modern-day environmental movement. And I thought this was really cool, because for somebody like myself, it meant that no matter where you were from, we were all part of inhabitants of this one planet, that it was our responsibility to take care of it and to take care of one another. Well, needless to say, the next lesson that we were introduced to in second grade was understanding about global warming and acid rain. So for an eight-year-old, you know, it was a little shocking and a little scary, but I thought to myself, all right, well, look, we already got the information. We know what's out there. Everything's going to be okay because the adults are going to take care of it. Things didn't really turn out the way I thought that they would. And uh, as I'm here with you all today, we're, we're living through a social and ecological crisis. In fact, just last week, 11,000 climate scientists came together and they signed a letter that is declaring that we're now living in an environmental emergency and warned of untold human suffering if we did not take drastic action. So our future and the future of generations to come, those kids who for the first time are learning about what we're calling climate change, depends on our ability to come together and to do the necessary things. So my intention is not to be negative or to foster pessimism or cynicism or anything like that. In fact, quite the opposite. I believe very strongly and very passionately that it is in this sense of urgency that we also have the biggest possibility to deeply and meaningfully transform our lives as a whole. And I'd like to share with you what that might entail if we're able to rediscover our public and our civic imagination. But before I go any further, I think it's really important to be honest with ourselves and to have the courage to kind of face the problem uh, that is in front of us and that means listening to what our scientists have been telling us. And the, the, the data and the evidence is quite clear, and the story goes a little bit like this. So this world that we humans have all kind of built together and that we all interact with on a daily basis consists on the use and the burning of fossil fuel energy uh, in order to power everything that we have. And this, of course, emits millions of tons of greenhouse gases every year in the United States alone. These gases accumulate in our atmosphere, and they trap the heat which is then warming the planet's climate. This then causes our sea levels to rise, it melts glaciers, it melts ice caps, which releases more gases into the atmosphere, and in turn starts to propel a series of feedback loops that accelerate the prospect of very dangerous consequences uh, for our civilization. This social logic and these economic practices associated with this are grounded on an expectation that we can have infinite extractive growth on a finite planet. And this, of course, produces exponential increases in pollution and in waste. And if we listen to our friends in the environmental justice movement, I mean, they've been telling us for decades that the, the very beginning of industrial society, waste and pollution has always played a role in targeting and adversely affecting the most vulnerable communities. This includes people that live in poverty, the dispossessed, migrants, and those direct descendants of colonization and of slavery. So today, we have a number of factors that are all coming together, and they're producing certain consequences, like we see in the frequency and intensification of storms, like Hurricane Harvey, Maria, and Sandy, we see it in the flooding and the eventual loss of our coastal regions. Heat waves and fires from the Amazon to California, which together with deforestation 
are destroying what is known to be the lungs of our planet in our trees and our forests. Public health crises because of the toxicity in our air and in our water. And we see this from the, from the lead in Flint, Michigan, to the contamination of the Rio Grande River, asthma rates, new cancers, and the effects on brain development experienced experience most harshly in communities with proximity to sites of pollution and of waste. It means we're living through what's being called the sixth mass extinction, or a total collapse of biodiversity and the extinction of species. And it also means that we're projecting hundreds of millions of climate refugees, not just from the warming of the climate, and not just from rising in sea levels, but also from disruption to agricultural systems, access to food safety, and drought. The IPCC, or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, released a report last year, and they gave us 12 years, 12 years to cut our emissions in half in order to make sure that the worst consequences are not irreversible. And they were very clear in their report that in order to do this on time, we would have to do far-reaching and drastic transformations to every aspect of society. So I promise I'm still, I still don't want to be negative and cynical here. Because as a researcher and as an advisor in the world of public policy, uh, one of the most interesting ideas that I've encountered is this idea of a Green New Deal, or essentially a call to action which proposes a framework through which communities and governments can understand how to begin to take action and make things start to happen, get things going. But what are the principles that are a part of this Green New Deal? Well, if you bear with me for a second and you imagine, what would it be like if we mobilized a mass movement of our productive capabilities? And by that I mean our capacity to do work, to build stuff, to make things, to use our intellect and our technology. And in that process, we created millions of jobs. And we centered that on achieving certain goals. Number one, to replace fossil fuels with systems of renewable energy. Number two, to transform the quality of the way that we produce and we consume and shift it towards sustainability and systems of recycling. And number three, if we offered a 21st century economic bill of rights for all. I believe that would be the cornerstone of a society that not only would be sustainable, but also prosperous. So, piece of cake, right? Easy. <laughs> well, it's not so much outside the realm of possibility and imagination to uh, undertake these kinds of bold and ambitious goals. In fact, during the Great Depression and leading up to the Second World War, the United States government offered a new deal to its people. And later, that same initiative and that same public spirit would take the form of an agenda for a great society. And we actually did transform our society and our economy. There are many great examples to draw from. Essentially, we employed people to build bridges, highway systems, museums, parks, hospitals. We supported our artists, and we created things like Social Security and Medicare, systems that guaranteed a certain level of stability in people's lives. And in doing so, we proposed a different kind of world that we now oftentimes enjoy and even sometimes take for granted. Now, when we imagine this kind of situation, how that compares to the environmental moment that we're in, we have to kind of understand and, and think to ourselves, well, what comes next? You see, technological solutions alone isn't exactly what we need. We have the policies and we have the ideas to start moving forward. But what we might need is to answer the question, how can we galvanize and mobilize an entire community to want to be a part of this, to participate and to support these kinds of changes? And that might mean having to look down and reflect on ourselves and the kinds of uh, ideas and understandings and the assumptions that we might have about one another and what might need to be reevaluated or changed. So let's take the idea 
of prosperity and happiness, right? We all want to be happy and prosperous. And traditionally, I think we, th- we imagine this idea to mean uh, abundance, wealth, success. And it's no surprise that in today's culture, we're very much bombarded and encouraged to be happy, to be successful, to be perfect in a lot of ways. But when we look beneath the surface, we find a different story being told. We're also living through a situation where we have a mental health crisis, addiction, bankruptcies over medical costs, foreclosures and homelessness, and often the scapegoating of the most vulnerable. So I don't think it's a coincidence that while we are living through this environmental crisis, we also are living through a social one. If we turn to the ancient Greeks for maybe some insight, we can see that a person like Aristotle, who was far from perfect but important nonetheless, was also very interested in this idea of happiness and prosperity. But he understood it under this notion of flourishing. He wanted to know how could people flourish in the world. And what he understood is you could not separate a person's flourishing from the community and the polity that that person was a part of. We were all part of this one community and this one polity, and that's how we produced the kind of flourishing that we all needed. And Aristotle had this idea called an intellectual virtue. There were many of them, but one of them that was essential was what he called phronesis, that translates to practical wisdom. And the thing about practical wisdom is that it exists and takes the form of stories and narratives, the stories and the narratives that we all tell each other. And it encourages us to come together, to dialogue, and to deliberate so that we can better understand one another. So I think to myself, today we have a lot of science, a lot of great information and knowledge. We have technology. But where is the wisdom? And what happens to a society when wisdom is pushed to the side? So I think if we can reevaluate and introduce an idea like wisdom, perhaps success, prosperity, and happiness doesn't have to be so associated with things like power, competition, and control, but rather can be opened up to other deeper dimensions of the human experience, including health, vitality, friendship, love, and solidarity. But you don't have to turn to the ancient Greeks for this. In fact, indigenous peoples that occupied all of the Americas also had a very similar idea in their conception of relationality. The Lakota people, for example, had a prayer that said, all my relations, which emphasized the importance of understanding ourselves as one interrelated whole with each other, with the earth, for all of time. By transforming the way that we understand prosperity, with relationality and with wisdom, perhaps we can breathe life into into a new understanding of sustainability. See, we've been told that the economy and the environment are always in opposition from one another. That we take into consideration ecological limits on a finite planet, we would have to sacrifice jobs and economic growth. But what if we understood that in the same way that we mobilized ourselves to get out of the Great Depression and to go to World War II, we could also mobilize ourselves to go to war against the situation that we ourselves have put ourselves in. And the good news is that green jobs is one of the fastest and most exciting growing areas of research. There are so many things we can do, not just from the millions of jobs that can be created by changing Uh, our energy systems into solar, wind, and hydroelectric, but also in building new transportation systems all across the country and all across our different states. By introducing regenerative agriculture to our farmers and supporting them and allowing them new ways of having more direct ownership of the thing that they produce. Buildings, retrofitting buildings with energy efficient systems and new ways of doing things. There are so many opportunities supporting new kinds of research that will produce new kinds of technologies. So the the possibilities are limitless if we just set our minds to it and come together to try to imagine a different kind of future for ourselves and for future generations. So while this might seem a little daunting, I think it's part of our destiny. In fact, I believe that whether you're an immigrant or not, 
we all are here because of the sacrifices and the work that our parents and our ancestors have given. And in that, we also carry with us the legacy of history and the burden of historical tragedy. But I think we still have the right to heal ourselves and to free ourselves from the links of generational trauma. So if we can draw from wisdom and we can draw from our relationships, then maybe we can flourish while we save the planet and realize the potential that we all share. Thank you.